Hi, welcome to AETN Presents On the Same Page. I'm Tommy Sanders. When it comes to poets, we've been pretty lucky on our show in the past calendar year. Twice, we've had poets who have received probably the highest award you can get as an American poet, the Poet Laureate designation. In 2006, it was Billy Collins. Today, we'll get to visit with the man from Lincoln, Nebraska, Ted Couser. After our visit with him, we'll uh, talk with a panel of readers about his work. And the two books we're featuring today, well, his latest collection, Delights and Shadows, and another book, The Poetry Home Repair Manual, a book about creating poems, learning how to do that. We'll have our panel a little bit later, and right now, our visit with Ted Couser. here for this edition of On the Same Page at Murphy House on the campus of Hendricks College in Conway. And the Murphy visiting poet at this time, we're taping this program, is Ted Couser. Ted Couser was the Poet Laureate for the United States 2004 to 2006. Uh, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for this collection called Delights and Shadows, which uh, the prize was awarded in 2005. I think the book came out in 2004. He's a recipient of numerous other prizes and recognition in the world of poetry. Uh, a native of Ames, Iowa. Grew up in Ames. Grew up in Ames, uh, undergraduate degree from Iowa State. Right. And mm -hmm. your master's degree from the University of Nebraska mm -hmm. at Lincoln. Welcome, Ted Kuzer. Thank you. It's a to, pleasure to be on here. On the same page. Welcome mm -hmm. to Conway. Mm -hmm. I hope you enjoy your stay here. You bet. This book right here, we've mentioned Delights and Shadows, but the one I'd like to start with is your newest book, actually, as I understand it, The Poetry Home Repair Manual. I've seen a lot of collections of poetry, but this, this has nothing to do with being a collection. It's about how to make poetry. Well, you know, I teach poetry writing to graduate students at the University of Nebraska, um, I just as a half-time professor there. And this is kind of a compilation of things that I've told these students over the years. Um, and I finally decided I'd see if I could get it all between covers, and uh, it's been it's been well received. Did you intend it just for students, or is it, or is it for anyone who's interested? Well, in actually, for anyone. Yeah. I, matter of fact, I I would like it very much if if people who are just have a you know the slightest interest in writing would look at it because I. I really do think it could be helpful. And I, I would imagine uh, uh, this has probably taken the place of some textbooks in some creative writing programs. Well, well, you, I'm sure you have no way of knowing I can't, how extensively. But. I can't relish that it's taken the place of other <laughs> textbooks, but yes, it probably has. Yeah. And it's, uh, the, the Poetry Home Repair Manual, how did you choose the name for that? That's kind of Oh, I have no idea, you know, <laughs> other than that I'm sort of a tinkerer, you know, and I thought that home repair was a way of, also a way of taking the sort of elevated nature out of poetry writing. I, I thought, you know, we're talking about basic tools here. So. Well, you kind of start, and this is unusual, you kind of start the book, you draw the reader in sort of by deflating poetry, talking about how it's undervalued in our world, in our society. I thought that was quite, and, and it's, it's fascinating the way you do it, and it truly is an undervalued quantity in our world. Well, uh, yes, indeed. You know. Yeah, and it's, you, you make a great analogy that you could take the... Uh, <laughs> What, the, the, the manuscript from T.S. Eliot's uh, uh, greatest collection to any convenience store in the town where you live and nobody give you 10 gallons of gas. That's but right. That's nobody a, give you one gallon. A one gallon. Is that what you said? One well, gallon of I gas. I probably said 10, but, you know, yeah. you, I, frankly, I don't think you could get a candy bar for that manuscript probably. You get past <laughs> that admonition to your reader and you get right into the business of, of how to make poems. And, and, and that's, uh, that's, how did you go about, where do you start in telling someone how to, how to become a poet, how to write a poem. Well, the most important thing, of course, is getting them to read poetry and read a lot of it. I, I ask my graduate students to read 100 poems for every one they try to write because you learn so much from that, from just, you know, by example. And then also I emphasize something in here that I think is very important, and a lot of poets would disagree about this, but I think we have to think about the reader on the other end of this thing. What, is the, what are the reader's expectations? What is that reader going to get out of a poem? You make a, a great point about why poetry sometimes is difficult and inaccessible to people because it's crafted that way. Sometimes because poets think it has to be crafted that Absolutely. way for in order to gain the right sort of attention. Yeah, that's a huge that's a huge dis area of discussion. But it is quite possible that a lot of poetry is difficult because critics love difficulty and critics establish reputations, and so the poets are giving the critics something to interpret upon which the critics can build their careers and then pull the poets along with them. You know, it's a 
We're talking with Ted Kuzer, who is the Murphy Visiting Poet here at Hendricks College as we tape this program, uh, the former United States Poet Laureate, uh, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for his work, Delights and Shadows. And did you, well, let's talk about your start in the world of poetry. Did you set out to be one of these difficult and accessible <laughs> poets? I, I, uh, the main impetus for me as a very young man writing poems was girls. That's what I was mostly interested <laughs> in. And I thought, I didn't have a whole lot else going for me. I had no athletic ability. I had no... Um, I uh, couldn't play a musical instrument. I couldn't, you know, do any of those things. And I thought, well, you know, maybe poetry would work, you know. So that's that's really what drove me into it, I think. And if you ask a lot of young artists or people in the arts community, and they, if they were honest about it, sex is at the basis of a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> and many other pursuits as well, that's I, right. I, I would it's, imagine. It, it's at the basis of everything, of course, yeah. 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 And uh, obviously... Well, I don't guess we're going to expect any collection of those early poems to those girls. No, at any no, time. they're <laughs> all gone, I <laughs> those think. Those are yeah. gone. My high school girlfriend, um, when we broke up, uh, supposedly burned many of my poems that I had, I had written for, which is, is a very good thing that they're no longer out there. Where do the most engaging poems come from? Do they come from great ideas or from memories or for just... Are they full blown? Are they fra I, flag fragments when they occur to you? Um, well, the way I write, the poems sort of happen. I, I just sit down and try to write something, and then the you know it, whatever it is emerges from that activity as much as anything else. And and 28 days out of 30, I'm a complete failure at it. I mean, I, what I write is just junk. Um, if at the end of the year I've got written 10 poems that I really like, and that's writing every day, then I feel really good about it. Ten but, poems out of maybe a hundred, or oh, one hundred and fifty, yeah. or two hundred. Um, yeah, yeah. Pretty much every day I'm working at it, you know. So yeah, that's right. You say in your work that it's so important to be in there every day. You don't sit. You don't wait for inspiration. To Show pick up, up the for pencil. work. Showing up for work yeah. is your point there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You set out, of course, as you say, to be a poet. Your education was was toward that end. Yet you took off on another career to pay the bills. Because as, right. you, as, you, as you point out in the book, The Poetry Home Repair Manual, poetry will not, will not pay the bills, won't buy you a bag of groceries, but to pay those bills, you, you took off on another career. Are we deprived of a lot of your work because you didn't have the time to, oh, to no, be there I every wrote, day? No, I, when I, was, I worked for many years at a desk in an insurance company, and, but I did all my writing before I went to work, and I wrote every day. So I would get up at 4.30 and write till about 7 and get my necktie on, go off and work at the office. And... Uh, you know, I knew that I was, uh, you know, not going to be able to support myself as a writer. You, uh, you do you still get up at four thirty every yes, day? Yes, I do. Yeah. See, yeah. I didn't today. Schedule. Yeah, but, <laughs> but almost every. special circumstance. Yeah, here today. when I'm at home, I do. Sure. You mentioned that ratio of 150, 200 to to 10 poems in a year's time that you think are really good. How do you, I mean, judging your work is probably not the easiest thing to do. Have you ever written a poem that you thought wasn't quite worthy, yet someone else had a look at it and thought it was the greatest thing they'd seen? Well, that's happened, but m more often it's the ones that I think are really brilliant that somebody will say, oh, come on, I mean, you know, you're, you know this is not in, any good, really, you know. Um, I had a poem a number of years ago that I sent to the Atlantic Monthly when Peter Davison was still the editor there, and he's now dead, but I said, I think this is the greatest poem that I've ever written. Here it is, you know. Would you publish it? You know, and he wrote back and said, "No." He said, "It isn't." You know, <laughs> so that happens all the time. Sure. You advise poets to be aware of their presence in the poem. What do you mean by that? Well, to think about how how the poet comes across as a personality in the poem. I think, as much as anything, you know, is this a is this a person that is that the reader is going to warm to or be turned off by? or be even repelled by, um, be angered by. That and you say it's important for the poet to be aware of this. Yeah, uh, you yeah, know, yeah. I mean, you can go in any direction you want to as long as you're thinking about what's on the other end of that communication. That person out there, that, that anonymous person miles from you who's going to read that poem, um, you have to think about what, the, what they're looking for. You know, poets all the time say, well, nobody's buying books of poetry. I mean, they won't buy books of poetry. Well, we have to write books that they want to buy. Mm. That's the way it works. This is, uh, of course, the book we've been talking about, the Poetry Home Repair Manual by Ted Kuzer, the book for which you received, the collection for which you received the Pulitzer Prize in 2005, is Delights and Shadows. 
Uh, this is a great collection, broken up into four chapters. Mm -hmm. uh, do you call them chapters or, or sections? Oh, sections. Collection, collection I, I would call them sections. Yeah. Would you? Would you tell? Me, I'm going to. I'm going to read the names. Of these would, just to satisfy my curiosity. The vague, not not vague, but but the general theme of each of one of those chapters. The first chapter is called "Walking on Tiptoe." Well, that one is. Uh, you know, these the, the, these poems are sort of clustered. Uh, by similarity in a way, but not a whole lot. And those not, are poems, not necessarily on a theme, but yeah, those are poems that are less personal and that are more about, you know, looking on at the other world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you have a, a second chapter which seems to be more about things to me, called the China Painters. Yeah, it's about things, and it's also about that generation of women that my mother was among who did things like China painting and cooking, you know, that sort of thing. Not that women don't cook anymore, but that you know that was such a big part of their lives. Yeah. The third chapter is Bank Fishing for Bluegills, and pardon me for being sort of a low-rent poetry <laughs> critic or <laughs> analyst right. here, but it seems to me to be about death. Yeah. Is, that, is it sort it's, of? It is, a, it is in a way about death. It's, it's also uh, another section of poems that, in which I am not terribly present, that I'm looking on. And That Was I is the fourth chapter. That Was I are the, are the most personal of the poems in there, and, and that, that poem that for which that section is named is a self-portrait of me um, yeah. out in the, in the world. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to have a good discussion about this with our panel of readers here in just a moment, but uh, I'm going to prevail on Mr. Couser here to read one of the poems sure. here called Memory, sure. uh, one of my favorites in this book, fascinating poem. Um, this is a poem about the, the way that we employ memory as writers. We sweep up everything in our memory and we write it all down and then we make something of it you know, sort of through the revision process. Memory. Spinning up dust and corn shucks as it crossed the chalky, exhausted fields, it sucked up into its heart hot work, cold work, lunch buckets, good horses, bad horses, their names and the names of mules that were better or worse than the horses. Then rattled the dented tin sides of the threshing machine, shook the manure spreader, cranked the tractor's crank that broke the uncle's arm, then swept on through the windbreak, taking the treehouse and dirty magazines, turning its fury on the barn where cows kicked over buckets and the gray cat sat for a squirt of thick milk in its whiskers, crossed the chicken pen, undid the hook, plucked a warm brown egg from the meanest hen, then turned toward the house where threshers were having dinner, peeled back the roof and the kitchen ceiling, reached down and snatched up uncles and cousins, grandma, grandpa, parents and children one by one, held them like dolls, looked long and longingly into their faces, then set them back in their chairs with blue and white platters of chicken and ham and mashed potatoes still steaming before them, with boats of gravy and bowls of peas and three kinds of pie, and suddenly, with a sound like a sigh, drew up its crowded, roaring, dusty funnel, and there at its tip was the nib of a pen. If you like action in your poetry, here's your man right there. <laughs> that one is action in fact, Memory by Ted Couser. Ted Couser, the Murphy visiting poet, and we caught up with him here at Hendricks College in Conway. That's from Delights and Shadows, a collection from 2004, the newest book, The Poetry Home Repair Manual. Enjoy your visit to Arkansas. Thank, Thank you, Tommy. Thank very you so nice much to for being you. with you. Yeah, appreciate you bet. it. You bet. Thank you. We're going to have uh, just a quick break. We'll be back with our panel of readers to discuss the work of Ted Couser, so stick around. All right, we're ready to go with our discussion of the Ted Couser books, and we've got our readers in place here. We didn't have to go too far to find them. Let me introduce them to you right now. Hope Norman Coulter is an adjunct professor of English at Hendricks College. She teaches poetry. Uh, has written two novels, is a published poet as well. Our other panelist, a student here at Hendricks, Ben Molini, a poetry student, among other things. Yes. Uh, are you an English major, Ben? Yeah, I'm an English major. English major, sophomore from Kansas City yep. here in Arkansas now. Uh, I'll start with you, Ben. You, you just told me before we started rolling here that this is actually one of the textbooks in your class, the, the Poetry Home Repair Manual. Is yeah. It, is it a good one? Do you like uh, it? Yeah, actually, I liked it a lot. I had to read it for uh, Dr. Coulter's class. So you not only <laughs> Want to read? You had to read it. Well, yeah, <laughs> but it was the kind of thing that we had uh, several textbooks, and I've got I've been into poetry for some time, and so a lot of people who know that but don't know me very well like to give me books about writing. So I read a lot of them and I see them, but I, I like Ted Couser because he consistently makes fun of himself, 
and of poetry in, uh, in the whole book, and I really like it. The, the Homer Why does that appeal to you, that he makes fun of Because himself? he's so unpretentious, and that he told, I mean, the Homer Repair Manual was a great name for the book, because he just, I mean, it was real basic, like it was real down to earth, he made a lot of jokes about, uh, you know, you do what works, you do what, what sounds good, what you enjoy, and what people will enjoy. Yeah. And like, I just, I really liked a kind of a realistic, like down to earth, uh, personal, kind of unpretentious approach to poetry. You know? I think it's kind of missing out there, so. Hope you chose the book, obviously, for the class. Obviously, you think it's pretty good. Right. Why I do you little, like it? I knew that Kuzer was coming, and I wanted the students to have a good background in reading um, his work. But when I picked up the Poetry Home Repair Manual, I was so pleased because it said a lot of things about poetry that I happened to agree with. And um, I also thought that he was really unaffected and modest. I like those qualities. Um, a lot of people think poetry is this esoteric thing and it belongs to this realm of it's, it's either so abstract you can't understand it or it's very gossamer and kind of floaty and and he's as Ben said real down to earth and uh, brings it into the realm of ordinary life and ordinary people. He starts the book and we, we talked about this in the interview by devaluing poetry in a way or at least talking about how it's devalued in our society. Is, is that a good way to start a book on learning how to write poems? Is, is, does that kind of draw you in, in in a sort of a reverse psychology way? To the students, yeah. I would yeah. say so, because we, uh, at least I read a lot of books, and uh, it always starts out with, with the incredible power of poetry and the amazing things you can do. And Ted Kuzer started out with like, man, you know, I used to try to get girls this way. <laughs> and, and I remember, like, I just, I thought that was really funny, just because I, um, I, I enjoy writing poetry, you know, I do it for myself, I think, I think a lot of people do, but I, I also do it for other people, you know, like, I've, I've gotten into slam and performance poetry, so, like, it is, it is about other people, uh, to a large extent in my mind, so I think, I don't know, like, I really appreciated that he just, he said, look, you know, your poetry should be, should be accessible, and poetry, you can, you know, it should be what you like, and it should be what, what your readers will like, and he didn't, he just kind of immediately cut away all the, uh, all the pretensions and all the, uh, I don't know, just extra kind of associations people have with poetry. You mentioned slam poetry, poetry slams, performance poetry. That's one of the things that people point to today when, when poetry is accused of becoming irrelevant. They say yeah. a lot of people, especially young people, are involved in, in performances, poetry slams. Like, Explain to us what that is. What is a poetry slam? Uh, poetry slam is kind of a, uh, it's a, it's a performance where you go, you sign up beforehand and um, each poet goes twice uh, for the whole slam. And you go up in front of people, you perform a poem, you just read it however you want with no props or no musical accompaniment, nothing like that. And it's three minutes or less, and then you get scored by five judges um, between uh, one and ten. And they just, you know, tell you how you go. And it's, they make the joke at every poetry slam, oh yeah, we're scoring poetry, it's a terrible thing to do. But uh, I just, you know, like I, I like it, it makes poetry accessible because it's, you have to get the people to understand it right there. They score you right after the poem. And so you have to go up there and, and say something that they can at least understand to some extent right there. And I remember asking Ted Kuzer about that. I said, well, what do you think, you know, about slam? And uh, he laughed and he said, well, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of different movements out there. He said, they're the cowboy poets, they're the beat poets, they're the slam poets, and they're the literary poets. And that's, he said, the literary poets are the only ones who think that everyone else should be like them. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Would you agree with that, Hope? Oh, that's probably, that's a pretty good pretty good statement. So. Now, how would a typical poem, I, I assume you've been to poetry slams, et, et cetera, how would a, a poem that you hear there differ from what you would see in a, the typical collection of, well, of poems a, a, that you, you pick up in a book? A slam poem, as I understand it, works, it works to the ear. Uh, the listeners are listeners. They're not, they're not seeing it on the page, and they don't have too much time to digest it and absorb it and go back the way readers do. Readers return to poems over and over. So, um, I like a lot. I like the energy of slam poetry. I like the way it does communicate immediately, and it, it makes an emotional response in the audience, which is key for any kind of poetry. I think it, poetry really depends on that emotional engagement. But it's a different animal from literary poems, and I don't, I don't let my students turn in their slam poems for for my classes. I've had a lot of slam poets, and they bring some good qualities to the class, but. Um, the, the poems we write really need to work on the page, and that's a little bit different. There's some technical differences. Learning disciplines like that, learning various meter schemes and so forth like that, even if a person is just compelled and, and cannot keep the poetry from coming out of them, is it good to spend the time to, to learn these disciplines, to do these exercises? And he's got some in the book here as well, to, to study the actual physical form of poems and, and to try to, to work within those, not 
maybe as, as your final aspiration, but just as an exercise, does it make you a better poet? Sure, I think so. We do some formal poetry in my courses where we work constrained by rhyme and meter and that sort of thing. Uh, Kuzer has some free verse poems and some formal poems, but it is, it's good discipline, as you say. I mean, a musician, even if uh, she wanted to write new age music or hip hop or something, she might start by learning counterpoint and, and learning fugues and learning all the, you know, the old basics sure. of how to do something. Makes you better. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Ben? I would absolutely agree. I remember thinking, even in the slam poetry world, there's, I mean, all of the things that I learned in high school English classes about poetic devices and about meter and about rhyme schemes and about uh, poetic forms that, like, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, are, are like, I mean, the hammers and saws and nails in, sure. like, in this toolbox. Like, you need them to write. That They're there because they're effective and they make poems effective. And that's, that you should totally learn them. What do you guys think of his story? Someone who, uh, one of those people who could not quit writing poems but knew also that he had to make a living and spend a whole life as an insurance executive, yet got up, as he said, 4.30 every morning to keep his craft going and keep it alive. Is that interesting? You, you, that kind of pulls people into poetry, doesn't it, to hear a story like that? Yeah, that was really inspiring to me, and I'm sure it was to students as well, but just, just uh, to have a model out there of someone who really puts it first in his daily life and, and summons that concentration, I think it's great. He's, he's not the, um, the only insurance business poet Wallace Stevens was there been you sure. know a lot of poets who had interesting day jobs but it was really good to hear it from his point of view just looked at it he said at the beginning I think of, of the lunch discussion that we had uh, Mr. Kuzer said uh, I'm just good at this because I've been doing it a long time and said if I'd been working on bowling for this long I'd be a really good <laughs> bowler so he just he just had that kind of self-effacing that's yeah. that's very appealing the book the lights and shadows uh, his I guess most recent collection took him he said about 10 years this is 10 years worth of poetry distilled down into this what do you think of this book Hope? oh I really like it of, of course it <clears throat> just has that um, that directness and plainness and a lot of a lot of memorable images in it good good book so you got everything you're looking for yeah. in a poetry book actually I remember thinking that there's a, a like just about every poem I read in this thing, they just every time I turned the page, it was something that either afterward, like immediately after reading it, I could just kind of think like that. That sort of echoes, you know, that just kind of resounds, or or it was amusing, or funny, and and or both. And I really thought that just it's it's all really high quality, and it didn't seem like he put anything in there for filler, just to fill more pages. It was all really good. I liked it a lot. Probably be good to hear some more from this book here. I know each of one each one of you, at least before we started, said you would read one of the <laughs> poems. So why don't we go ahead? Hope we'll let you go first. What poem have you selected? Well, I've picked one um, called Dishwater. A lot of a lot of old people figure in Ted Kuzer's mm -hmm. poems. I think he likes um, older people, and he likes the the world of their memories and the the world of their childhoods and that's that's gone. And, and he evokes that a lot, but. Um, and he goes back to memory a lot. He talks about this in, in this book. So you'll, you'll hear, when I read this, um, you'll hear a very clear memory of the speaker's grandmother. The poem's called Dishwater. Slap of the screen door, flat knock of my grandmother's boxy black shoes on the wooden stoop, the hush and sweep of her knob-kneed cotton apron stride out to the edge, and then, towed in with a furious twist and heave, a bridge that leaps from her hot red hands and hangs there shining for 50 years over the mystified chickens, over the swaying nettles, the ragweed, the clay slope down to the creek, over the red-winged blackbirds and the tops of the willows, a glorious rainbow with an empty dishpan swinging at one end. It's nice. E mentions in his book that one of his favorite exercises is to write poem for a week, for a month, where you're forbidden to talk about any of your feelings about anything. This, if you just read it, is devoid of any overt feelings put in there. Yet, when you, when you put all this image together, do you, do you get an idea that he's still saying how he feels about that subject when he, when he writes the poem? I would think this grandmother is a really vivid person in his childhood, and how many times uh, he, as a boy, must have watched her go and sling her dishwater out off the back porch. <laughs> very, very, very visual and, and a great poem. What did you select, Ben? Uh, I guess, not surprisingly, I selected a poem called "Student." Okay. <laughs> which uh, I remember that he read when he he came here to the uh, and he did a reading in the Staples Auditorium, and I remember he prefaced it by saying that the. 
he noticed, like walking around college campuses, that a lot of times students will overload their backpacks with books and just be like literally hunched under the weight and have to kind of like swing their arms out in front to counterbalance. And he said it was always just a really amusing walk he saw out of a lot of students. And uh, <laughs> so the green shell of his backpack makes him lean into wave after wave of responsibility, and he swings his stiff arms and cupped hands, paddling ahead. He has extended his neck to its full length, and his chin, hard as a beak, breaks the cold surf. He's got his baseball cap on backward as up he crawls, out of the froth of a hangover and onto the sand of the future, and lumbers, heavy with hope, into the library. We've all been that guy, I guess, haven't we? Yeah, or person? Right. I mean, heavy with hope, though. I don't remember being heavy with hope <laughs> so, so many times. Yeah, that's true. Did that, did that kind of surprise you at the end that he yeah, says that? What do you I, think he means by that? I thought it was really uh, just kind of a wonderfully, like, um, just kind of like witty and uh, just really realistic um, kind of portrayal of, of a student just kind of, you know, dazed. I've been, I sat down in a poetry class actually uh, yesterday next to a guy who like just dropped his bag and shook the floor and he was like, I've been awake for 11 minutes. <laughs> and I was like, all right. <laughs> and it's just, you know, that he's, he's stumbling into the library, which I thought was really cool. That, that, that seemed to be the connection to hope in there was that he's, Making his way through all of all of the student nonsense into into the library and the place of learning. All right, Ben Molini, mm -hmm. Hope Norman Coulter, thanks so much for for your love of poetry and, and your insights and uh, coming and talking about Ted Kuzer with us today. The books we've talked about: the Poetry Home Repair Manual and his collection Delights and Shadows. Thank you for being with us on the same page. I know every poet laureate, or most of them anyway, have a a, a project or or a, um, some sort of project that they. Had take under their wing and, and, and push forward. And I know you had a very important one, which is continuing today. It's called American Life in Poetry. It's a free weekly newspaper column that newspapers can download off a website, AmericanLifeInPoetry.org. Um, we're in about 150 papers right now. It's a very short column. It won't take out too much news hole. Um, and it's uh, basically I try to pick poems that newspaper readers can understand.